So now that we've um, looked at how sold as producers, and then we've looked at um, the product markets where uh, services are exchanged. Um, now we look at the other side uh, of the market. We look at households in their role as consumers. Because, um, so here we have households that produce services, and of course, households who buy um, services from other households. All right, so um, in their role as consumers, like there are two things we need to specify. First, we have to specify uh, the household's uh, utility function that will tell us how they decide how many service, uh, how many services they want to um, purchase, and then we'll have to look at the household's budget constraint, which will determine uh, their choices. So we start with the utility function. Um, so households are going to have utility over uh, two things. Um, so first, they'll have utility over uh, consumption of services, which we denote by C. Obviously, and that's why they are going to purchase services. Now, in our model, uh, we want to have an aggregate demand. Now, to have an aggregate demand, you households, you know, if you want to form an aggregate demand, here what's produced in the model is uh, services. So basically, we want to have an aggregate demand for services. Now, to build such an aggregate demand, household must have the choice between consuming services and something else. You know, if there is no choice, the concept of aggregate demand is not well defined. Because you need to, you know, you need to have the choice of how to use your income between uh, consuming services and doing something else with it. So typically, if you have a, a dynamic model, you know, uh, people may have the choice between consuming now and consuming uh, in the future. You know, between consuming now and saving. Now we we have a static model here, so we don't have that choice. Uh, so to be able to nevertheless have a, a well-defined aggregate demand, what we're going to do is to, as we had said at the beginning, we're going to introduce money um, and we're going to assume that households derive utility from uh, real money balances. So households will also derive utility from real money balances um, and we denote that M over P And so to break it down, so M is going to be nominal money balances. So that's just the amount of money you have in nominal terms. And P is going to be the price level. And so you deflate the nominal money balances by the price level to get real money balances. Uh, and real money balances, so they are going to enter the utility. Why? Well, because it represents a real wealth. And so the justifications we're going to give for people deriving uh, utility from real wealth is that, um, you know, basically people have wealth in the utility function. So let me add um, two side notes here before I uh, provide some justifications for why I think um, it's a good assumption, actually a realistic assumption to include wealth in the utility function. Um, so the first thing is that um, there are, you know, there are a bunch of papers that made the assumption that real money balances enter the utility function, like we'll do here, to create an, an aggregate demand. So that actually is an assumption that was fairly standard in the 70s and 80s. So in the 70s, you can go back to the famous um, Bauer-Grossman paper, 1971, on general disequilibrium. 
and then all the way to the 80s, you can go to the famous uh, Blanchard Kiyotaki paper on monopolistic competition, and you will see that both of these papers actually assume that real money balances uh, enter the utility function. Um, so that's something that's fairly standard. However, there are other modeling tools that you can use um, to get at the same effects and create an aggregate demand. So essentially what you need is that you have a non-produced good that people value in addition to the produced good. And then the trade-off, the choice between the produced and the non-produced good is going to give, uh, give rise to an aggregate demand. And so, for instance, uh, there's a famous hard paper um, that uses a generic non-produced good that enters the utility function that you know is in fixed fixed supply. Um, you could imagine having, say, land in the utility function because land is in fixed supply. It's not produced, and so if people value consumption and holding land, then you will get exactly the same type of effects. And in fact, that's an assumption that um, I make in some other paper. Um, you could imagine that uh, people value gold, and gold is essentially in fixed supply. Um, it's non-produced. And so the trade-off between consumption of produced goods and gold would give you an aggregate demand. So there are many, um, many ways uh, that you can get at the same effects. Uh, so second thing I want to say is that here I'm going to give you a justification for real money balances based on the fact that I think people do value holding wealth. Um, but it's not the standard justification. Um, usually when people include real money balances in the utility function, the argument is that money um, provides transaction services. And, you know, that was true in the past where you needed to hold some cash, some money to purchase a bunch of things. Um, you know, uh, but now that we have, uh, you know, credit cards that are accepted almost everywhere or phone payment that is accepted almost everywhere, uh, I think this justification of uh, the transaction services provided by money is less uh, compelling. Whereas, um, as I'll show you, I think it has always been true that people value holding wealth, and therefore I think it's a it's a better justification. Um, so what are the reasons why people uh, might value holding wealth? Um, and here, of course, so here's the only way that people can store wealth because we don't have gold or jewelry or land uh, or real estate is to hold money in this model. Okay, so if we can if we can justify that people and uh, derive utility from holding wealth, that's a justification for here, in this context, people valuing our real money balances. Um, so there are you know, at least um, two or three arguments. So uh, to justify real wealth in the utility function. Um, so one, of course, is um, just introspection. If you think about it, you know, uh, <clears throat> it's clear that wealth uh, provide social status and, uh, and, you know, and that's something that people value and therefore people will tend to try to accumulate as much wealth as they can. And not just, you know, typically we do assume that people hold wealth because they want to use it for future consumption. You know, that would be your typical economic model. Uh, you, know, you know, you're going to have wealth because you want to smooth consumption over time. Like wealth is valuable only as future consumption. But if you introspect a, a little bit, you realize that people often hold wealth, not just because they want to consume it in the future, but just because um, they feel good about holding wealth. They feel good about being uh, rich uh, and they enjoy some social status uh, from holding wealth. Um, and in fact, that's something that um, a lot of economists have noticed over the years. Um, so I have a couple of quotes here. Um, and so, you know, indeed, people have recognized for a long time that unlike what we typically assume, that people only value derived utility from consumption, you know, economists have, and social scientists have noticed for a long time that people also derive... Um, utility from holding wealth that's not going to provide future consumption. Um, so there is a very nice uh, Keynes quote uh, from 1919, where Keynes said, and he, he's trying to understand the saving patterns in Europe at the time, just after World War I. And he writes, the duty of saving 
became nine tenths of virtue. And the growth of the cake, cake being wealth, the object of true religion. Saving was for old age or for your children, but this was only in theory. The virtue of the cake was that it was never to be consumed, neither by you nor by your children after you. So Keynes already very perceptively, uh, more than 100 years ago, noticed that people do save and accumulate wealth, but it's not really for future consumption. It's just because it's something that they do, uh, you know, just for itself, that accumulation provides uh, utility. And there's another nice quote from uh, Irvin Fisher. And so that's quite interesting because Fisher is the one who in the 30s kind of invented the model of consumption savings that we use today. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, he said that a man may include in the benefits of his wealth, so beside future consumption, the social standing he thinks it gives him, or political power and influence, or the mere miserly sense of possession, or the satisfaction in the mere process of further accumulation. Uh, so all these guys noted that by introspection, you know, uh, people enjoy accumulating wealth. And in particular, because uh, <clears throat> because wealth offers social status and power, social power. Okay. Uh, so this is something that by introspection you realize. But now, um, today we have actually much um, stronger scientific evidence, um, and so neuroscientists have confirmed this intuition you get by introspection. Uh, so there is very good neuroscientific uh, neuroscientific evidence. Um, and so uh, that wealth itself provides utility independent of uh, independent of, of future consumption. And here, you know, you, I'm spending a bit of time justifying that assumption because that's a team, including wealth in the utilities, a team that we'll see recurring um, during the course. Um, and uh, so independent of consumption can buy. And, uh, and so here, and there's a very good summary of the evidence by Kammerer, Lowenstein, and uh, Prelec. 2005 is the date of that survey. Uh, so as I review the neuroscientific evidence, and here's what they summarize. Um, here's what the summary is. So they note that brain scans conducted while people win or lose money suggest that money activates similar reward areas as do other primary reinforcers like food and drugs, which implies that money confers direct utility rather than simply being valued only for what it can buy. Okay. Uh, so this is something that's, uh, that has been um, fairly well established uh, now. So now that we have uh, these two arguments, consumption real money balances into the utility function, we can uh, postulate a functional form for the household utility function. So here we'll keep it uh, fairly simple. So our utility U is going to depend on C, consumption of services, M over P, real money balances. And we'll just assume that it's um, 
concave function of consumption and real money balances and se separable um, in the two arguments. So we'll have key over one plus key times C epsilon minus one over epsilon plus one over one plus key M over P that real money balances epsilon minus one over epsilon. Um, and so here, two things to note. So key, we have a first parameter positive. What does it indicate? Well, you can see consumption is weighted by key over one plus key, so which is always between zero and one. And real money balances, it's weighted by one over one plus key, which is always between zero and one. So basically, thanks to this, uh, thanks to the key parameter, I can weight uh, the relative. So this is basically capturing the taste for services relative to wealth. Um, so notice the key trick here of the functional form is that this is between 0 and 1, and this is also between 0 and 1. So these are just two, uh, these are just two weights on services and real money balances. And so key is going to parameterize the test for service relative to wealth. And you can see in particular, if key is infinite, um, you can notice that um, households only value services, whereas if key tends to zero, households are only going to um, are only going to value real money balances. But in general, key is going to be strictly positive and finite, and therefore households are going to value both services and uh, and real money balances. But so the key thing is that high key means. Services are more valued. Okay, so you can parameterize how much you value services that, that way. And then second parameter that shows up in our utility function is epsilon. <coughs> and here we'd have to uh, impose for the model to be well behaved that epsilon is strictly greater than one. Uh, and epsilon here, as we've uh, as we've specified our utility function is going to correspond to the elasticity of substitution. Uh, between consumption and uh, real money balances. It's an elasticity of substitution, and it will have to be uh, strictly greater than one. 